Welcome to Understanding the Gospel. Uh, this is a series called Talking Truth in which we explore some difficult questions. Uh, the one that we're thinking about today is does becoming a Christian mean becoming boring? Uh, so it's a, a question that surfaces in all kinds of uh, circumstances. Uh, many people may have this perception of Christians that they're boring because of things that they uh, don't do perhaps. Um, and I guess as we discuss it, um, maybe the place to start is just thinking a little bit about what actually does the Christian life involve? Um, because it can quite easily be just defined in terms of what it doesn't involve. Let's go to a verse in the Bible then that where Jesus said himself, uh, I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly or to the full. So clearly the life that he intended Christians to have was a full life. Uh, and if, if there's a perception uh, that it's not that, then either it's because Christians are presenting it badly uh, or because the non-Christian is not able to grasp what that, that, other, that, that, that new life in Christ is. Yeah, I think that's a very important point, Graham, that you make there for non-Christians uh, would perceive the Christian life as boring. I, I was, you know, I came to become a Christian in my mid-twenties. And if you had said to me in my late teens, early twenties, that, um, well, there's no, gonna be no more uh, drinking in pubs, there's no more be going to nightclubs, there's going to be no more um, uh, girlfriends and uh, things like that in, in that sense, then I would say, wow, that sounds pretty boring. That's not for me at all. I mean, how boring is that? That's all I live for, you know? Um, but then when you become a Christian, what happens is God gives different desires into you as well. So that which you once saw as exciting and great for life, you actually think, no, actually, that's, that's, not, that's not the way to live. And how you want to live is, is now different from how you once lived. So I can understand someone thinking, who's a non-Christian, thinking a Christianity is boring, I would have done. I think a word different. Oh, sorry, yeah. Graham, go ahead. I was going to say, but people's perception of Christianity, so to speak, of becoming a Christian, is in just simply attending this dry, dusty old church once a week and coming and going and no interaction with anybody. Well, it's completely the opposite. It's living a life with Christ, not just like fulfilled in Christ, but filled by the Holy Spirit as well. Mm. So it's, you're given an amazing gift by him to, to live your life to the full. So not just yeah. dusty. I think, sorry, on you. Yeah, that, uh, Paul, you, you mentioned that word different. Mm -hmm. um, and you, you spoke about um, some of the sort of very obvious differences um, in behaviour. Mm. Um, and behaviour flows from interest. Of course. Um, so you do things because you get a particular interest in them and you find satisfaction and fulfilment in them. Um, and I think when you become a Christian, um, the difference is not only behaviour, but it's interest. Yep. Um, because uh, you become so radically different in yourself um, by becoming a Christian that God changes you to the extent he calls us a new creation. <clears throat> and as individuals with our different interests, um, which come from within, it then leads to different behaviour. And different is key because a Christian is different. Yes. Um, at our core, there is a different interest, a different priority, which is Jesus Christ is the priority for a Christian, pleasing him, loving for him, serving him, and that results in different behaviour. But that behaviour to a Christian it's full of joy, it's full of satisfaction, but to someone who's not a Christian, it looks just so different from... See, I think that that brings us on to a point where we need to challenge the assumption that, that what non-Christians do is truly satisfying mm -hmm. and that they look at what Christians do as being boring. Now, if we say that by no means am I denying the fact that there is pleasure in sin because the Bible tells it, we all experience the fact that there's pleasure in sin. But if you look at a culture that we have here in the West or here in Scotland, then there is, it's an incredibly hedonistic society. We have every availability of pleasure that is open to us. There's no societal kind of uh, problems with engaging in sinful behaviors. It's, it's open season in a sense. And yet 
Our society is the one that prescribes the most antidepressants. People are the most depressed and everything like that. And the two are linked. Mm -hmm. We cannot uh, talk about the fact that it's, it's not only about the pressure that people face, it's the fact that life is empty. Yeah. And so you're saying Christianity keeps people from things that actually won't satisfy them? Yes. We, yeah, we all look for satisfaction mm -hmm. in life. And I think what, what the Bible teaches us that, you know, I, for myself when I was not a Christian, I was seeking satisfaction, but never finding that fulfillment in whatever, whatever that might have been, the sort of pastimes and that. There was never, oh, that's absolutely brilliant. And that lasted for a time. But now you're a Christian, you find satisfaction in, in Christ and in the promises of Christ and, and the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah. So everyone looks for satisfaction to, to be yeah. satisfied. But as Mick Jagger once said, I can't find no satisfaction yeah. in those things outside of it Christ. It goes to the heart of what a Christian is. Yeah. You know, you, you, and you, as you began this conversation, we're talking about a Christian. I mean, if, if, if your view of a Christian is, is to do with um, behaviour and you're defined by what you do, so you go to church, Graham, you know, you're talking about who wants to just go to church. Well, someone who's not a Christian would find that of limited satisfaction. Or reading ten, your Bible. Or reading your Bible or spending time with Christians. And so, and so you, you know, the, being a Christian, that's not a Christian. You know, that's some of the things a Christian may do, but it's not being a Christian. Mm. And so being a Christian is a, a, a complete transformation that God effects in me as an individual. Um, and, you know, the Bible uses terminology like that, like being born again. Um, it speaks about being taken from one sphere of authority, you know, which is characterized by darkness and satanic influence and the world separated from God to be transferred into his sphere of authority, which his kingdom is, is different. It's to do with light and mercy and compassion and, and uh, meaning for eternity. And so perspective changes because we are changed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, not because we just adhere to a certain code of conduct yeah, or, or system of... And it, it comes back to a fundamental question, doesn't it? Uh, which is, why were we made in the first place? Uh, why God created man to be in relationship with him? Uh, so, so the obvious answer to the question, where is the most satisfying life found, would be in an enjoyment of that relationship. Because if God is the creator uh, and he created us with that purpose, we're not going to be satisfied until we come to that. So although the perception from the outside uh, may be awry because uh, uh, you're, when you're outside of the thing, you don't actually understand what it's like to be inside it, if I can put it like that. Uh, uh, if you look at it logically, uh, we ought to go to the designer uh, to see the best way for the designed thing to fulfill its purpose properly. And I think that for the most part, people are looking for joy in a particular set of circumstances. So whether that be marriage or family or relationships or money or fame or all, it's circumstantial. Whereas God has created us that our greatest joy is to be found in him. Yes. And when our satisfaction is in him and our joy is in him, then our circumstances can be wildly different and can be actually quite challenging and difficult, but that doesn't affect our joy because our joy is in God. Yes. How would that work for the young teenager or mid-teenager who uh, doesn't then get to do some of the things that all, all their friends do? They're a young Christian, and but they are. What would be our words to them? They're finding life a little bit boring, really, because all my friends are out uh, a weekend at different things. They all get to go and play football on the Sunday morning. I've got to go to church, you know. What, think, what do we say to them? I think even before we answer the question, it's important to point out that this is a common misconception because the way that Christians portray the Christian life can be all about the things that you don't do rather than emphasizing all the things that we can now do because we are a Christian. So I think that keeping that in mind when we answer a question, which is a good question because, yeah, a lot of people think like that. And I do think that, sorry, John. So I was just going just gonna to say, I guess, to, to keep things in their proper perspective, we talked about Christianity being at its heart, about knowing God. Um, that's what Jesus said, this is eternal life, to know the only true God and Jesus Christ. Um, but that stands at the heart of Christianity. Um, 
the God who we come to know has also given lots of things that we can enjoy and participate in, but we need to keep them in their proper place as, as God's good gifts. Um, and in themselves, they can't bring satisfaction. So even if, even if something's good, um, it's not an end in itself. Um, God is the only end in himself that can actually, that can actually satisfy. Um, I, 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 and I guess that, that's, that's, things which are, that's things which are good when you look at, <clears throat> at stuff which is, which is harmful, actually. The, the Christian is being kept from that. Yeah, and I think that's a good... Sorry, Graham, what are you going to say? I think that's, that's certainly in my situation, having five children, uh, and saying yes, well, I think it's best as a, as a Christian, you don't go and do that, but we're going to go and take you to here, and they've got another 30 friends that you've met at different camps or different places, and, 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 and you'll see how different their company is than the company you have in school. So it's providing for them and providing something of substance for them, not just saying, no, you're not doing that, but, but look, this is what we're going to do instead. So seeking because to keep someone from something harmful really is what, what is inside for a child. this idea of difference is important as well, that um, to, to, to be different can be taken to extremes um, unnecessarily. So if you take your example of someone who's in their teens, teenage life is hard enough, mm. Mm. Um, but to be a teenager and to be different <laughs> is very difficult yeah. um, for whatever reason. Yeah. And if you're a Christian, then you face that because you essentially are different and therefore the way that you behave is going to be different if you're going to live out your Christianity. And that's not easy. And so as parents and those uh, who, who work with teenagers, I think it's important that there's no extra differences made for them than that which just flow out of being a Christian. So you're not um, imposing things that make life even harder. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, you know, there are things that are not bad, sinful, etc. We know that about growing up, activities and so on. Um, and it's not a case that when you become a Christian, you're isolated from anything that is wholesome, good and enjoyable to participate in with your friends. You're not going to locked in your room and shut away all the time. But the issue is not so much that. The issue is, you know, in terms of should I do this or should you allow them to do that is, is much more, you know, what is it? Is it harmful? Is it good? And these are the issues mm. that determine it. Not, yeah. you know, you can't do everything that your friends are doing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think that's hits, important. This hits at the heart of who God is and that God is a loving and a wise God. And therefore, when he gives us a command to keep away from something, it's not because he's a killjoy. It's because he actually wants us to have the greatest degree of joy and happiness. Mm -hmm. It's not to prevent us from enjoying things because actually the enjoyment of those things will actually lead to sin or is sin and will lead to unhappiness or broken relationships or whatever it may be. But sin has consequences and God wants to preserve us from that. So he gives us these commands. It's not for our detriment, it's for our blessing. Yeah. So if there is, just to ask a hypothetical question, if there is a Christian or we know, you know somebody that finds their normal life as a Christian boring, what do you suggest you do with them? Or say to them or how, how can you help them? They need to understand that their greatest joy needs to be in God. That is mm. fundamentally the problem. So if, if, they, if they are looking for their joy in their circumstances, be that in a, in a relationship or in a friendship or in having things which our society prizes so much, they're looking in the wrong place. Mm. They need to look to God himself. I think it's the stimulation of whatever will cause that so that um, in practical terms, I mean, you could, that is the ultimate goal. But if someone's who's 21 sitting and, you know, they go to work and um, they have a relationship with their work colleagues, which is limited by their desire not to engage in some of the things their work colleagues are doing after work, you know, they're going down drinking, getting drunk or whatever the weekend and getting out. And so therefore there is a separation takes place in terms of, and we've all been there, that the friendships can go so far, but then it's limited by your desire not to participate in some of the activities. So then, you, to me, the stimulation of this concept that God is the ultimate good and God is the ultimate source of enjoyment, there, need, there should be practical things you can do to stimulate that um, within your life, which is, for example, 
not being passive, but being active in the pursuit of Christian company and fellowship. Mm -hmm. um, not being passive, but active in structuring your life so that the Bible um, forms a very large part of your life in its study, in its reading, in its enjoyment and practice, and also you know going to listen to others teach, and uh, also in engaging and serving the Lord in witness and outreach with others and so forth. There are many ways that can stimulate this practical steps rather than just passively sitting in your room saying, woe is me, I don't have any friends. And you know, um, and that's a recipe for disaster mm -hmm. because it will just create a vacuum and then you'll drift toward you know, friends that maybe take you into things that you really don't want to be involved in. So pick, just picking out one of those things that Stephen mentioned, you mentioned there, uh, the, the structuring, the relationship, the personal relationship with God is so crucial uh, because uh, it can be, there's the possibility uh, for a Christian to think that it's all about going to church. Uh, and whilst it's very important, and whilst Christian friends are very important, especially for maybe for teenagers, uh, but the, the crucial thing is the personal relationship with God because all of those outside things can fall apart in one way or another very easily. Uh, but the personal relationship with God, if that's built on, then that is something that, that stays. Uh, that is something that will be an anchor yeah. uh, for the person. Because and it comes back to what Alistair was saying about uh, knowledge of God. Knowing God is really the ultimate, although that sounds a very uh, nebulous thing to a, to a young person. Even to most of us, maybe, uh, it sounds quite nebulous at times. But that is what we've got to be looking, looking towards. But that relationship is based on the fact that we read and study and meditate upon the Bible yeah. because that's how we have that relationship with God. That's how he communicates with us. And I like what Elizabeth Elliot said. She says, reading the Bible can sometimes be like peaches and cream. Not that I think that's a nice meal, but she did. And it was the point was that sometimes that when we read the scriptures, it's a lot drier and it, it, and it just takes time. But the more we read it, the more we study, the more we meditate upon it, then our appetite for it grows, our appreciation of it grows. Mm -hmm. So we might get to that point where just picking up our Bible and reading it is like eating peaches and cream. Mm -hmm. But to begin with, it might be more like a bit of toast. Yeah, I think we need to you know, be honest uh, as we are and say sometimes that, that, can, be, that can be tough as well. Yeah. You, know, that, you know, when someone becomes a Christian, um, and, and seeking to live for Christ and seeking to stimulate those things, as Stephen has helpfully said to us there, there can be still tough times. There are new desires in, inside us. I, again, I draw from some personal experience, you know, coming to Christ in my mid-20s, so all through my late teenage years and uh, early to mid-20s, there was going out, there was partying, and, and I remember the first, uh, I think it was about, about the first year I was a Christian, New Year's Eve, and I sat in this uh, one bedroom flat on my own at sort of 10 o'clock at night. And not that you wanted to be where you normally would have been, but equally you were reflecting that normally you'd have been re surrounded um, with lots of people. You would have called friends, uh, maybe acquaintances at that time, and you would have been it, having that enjoyment uh, mainly induced through alcohol and other things. Uh, and you didn't want that, of course, but sitting in, in your one bedroom flat on your own on New Year's Eve was a vast difference and quite tough uh, as well. Much as you sit, sought to find your satisfaction in God, there, there can be that. And that, that can be the case in, in the Christian life. We have to be honest on that. And then there's this mature and process uh, that comes through. So there can be difficult times. So, so all, all of what we've talked about describe so for the Christian life is different in terms of its priorities and its direction and so on. Um, does that push us then towards a position where where Christians should just kind of live separately from everyone else and, and kind of cut themselves off? No, definitely not. I mean, I think there's a difference between being different and being isolated. Mm -hmm. I mean, actually part of, of the mission of Christians is not to go away from people, but go towards people. Mm -hmm with a message and with a life uh, testimony and a witness, um, because the Lord Jesus did that. Exactly, yeah. um, in his life, 
he was actually, it's actually something the religious people accused him of. And they thought it was a criticism, but actually it was a great attribute that he sought out the vulnerable in society. He sought out those that were despised because of their sinful lifestyles. And he um, got in amongst them, um, not to participate in the sin, but to bring the life-changing message of the gospel um, that would transform their lives. And when you look at the examples of the people who came to the Lord Jesus from uh, very uh, difficult circumstances, the transformation was fantastic. It brought joy and it brought um, a release from the oppression of satanic influence and sin and the terrible consequences of sin and brought them into new life and joy and peace and satisfaction. Um, and so I think scripture is clear when it says to Christians, go into all the world. It doesn't say run away from the world. Um, and so to be different, yes, but not to be isolated. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, the Lord was a man amongst men. Yeah. Which, which brings its own challenge because, you know, it's easy to speak in absolute terms. But that brings its own challenges. You know, to how, to what extent do you go? You know, to what, to what, to what extent can you build friendships with people who are so different? Um, and a, you know, in a working environment, in a community environment as well, um, there's a whole series of judgment calls that someone has to make. And sometimes, when you're very young, um, these judgment calls have to be made for you, for your own good and your own immaturity. Mm. And sometimes. You know, for example, teenagers, you know, they live in social media. That's their environment. Um, and sometimes judgment calls by parents and those who want to help them have to be made about their interaction with that and the difference they need to show in how they interact with that media and so on. So it can be quite testing. Yeah. Because the, those links will be different for different people. Some people uh, could, can survive, some Christians can survive in a, a very difficult environment where they're reaching out with the gospel. Other Christians would be best not there just because of their personality or their vulnerability or whatever. Yeah, I th and I think as well, you know, when we in, is engaging with society, wholeheartedly endorse that as well. But an eco, we need to remember that God will never call us uh, to any action which is sinful mm -hmm. so that we might reach people. So whatever, however Christians engage with society, um, you know, whatever age we're at, we, we don't need to go in anything a sin to do God's will uh, and engaging with the gospel. And I, I guess we are living in a culture where um, there's a lot less public conversation about God, for example, mm -hmm. in the workplace. Uh, so there, there might be uh, less opportunity <laughs> or more hostility uh, to a Christian seeking to be open about these things. Um, I guess, what, what advice would you give um, to, to younger Christians, um, or indeed to any Christian? Um, should they just relate to people in, in a kind of superficial way or to the best they can, or should um, should they be seeking to share uh, about the, their faith and about, about the scriptures? I think the first thing that it's important for us all as Christians is not to be self-righteous. Mm -hmm. Because in, in one sense, you want to be honest with the Bible and how it applies to modern day living and call sin, sin. But so often that can come across it from a, in a self-righteous way. So the first thing I would say to, a, to any Christian, young Christians, is be careful that it's not self-righteousness and that you're not thinking of yourself as better because we're not, we're exactly the same. I think another thing would be to your non-conformity to their behaviour actually is a testament to the Saviour as well. If, if you can explain why I'm not coming out drinking with you tonight or I'm not going to do whatever with tonight because as a Christian I am filled by the Holy Spirit or trying to be not be controlled by anything else but be controlled by the Spirit and so I'm showing in your life that you are different not just by saying oh no I'm a Christian I wouldn't do that but you show by your actions that they, they can help each other as exactly. well I think you know because life's a um, fellowship and you know you know okay I'm not going out with you know is, is negative in the sense that I'm not doing something but you know Christians should be with each other, you know, and they should be, it's not that they just have to live isolated lives from each other. And um, friendships should be built and community enjoyed. And that's, a, that's perfectly um, true for Christians as it is for any individual. I was meaning in, in relation to testify in the workplace or whatever, you know, sometimes you don't maybe 
necessarily can't even preach the gospel sort of publicly or through your mouth, but, but, but by your actions themselves are attesting to exactly what you're doing. Yeah, you're a living epistle. Yeah, exactly. Seen in but, but it's important to explain why your reasons yeah, as well. Yeah. Um, otherwise, people may just make the assumption that you're just boring. Oh, you're odd. Yeah. <laughs> oh, you're so, odd. Yeah. All, the, all, this, yeah. sorry, all this talk about uh, life and living and witness and gets us back, doesn't it, to the question, you know, uh, is Christianity boring? Mm -hmm. So I think even what we're sort of exploring here it's not, it's not boring. It, it Christians brings great can challenge. be boring. They, Christians can be boring. <laughs> they were often boring before they were Christians. Pro, pro, yeah, pro, probably if you were boring before, you're probably still going to be boring afterwards. I read something once in Sunday say that a Christian is just Sunday that follows Christ. And I am definitely happy with following a man that can walk on top of water, that can heal the lame people, that can bring people back from the dead. That's the person I want to follow because he wasn't boring. He is full of life. Yeah, I think absolutely. that's pretty good. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. But the perception will always be they all think it's strange that they do, you don't run with them to the same excess of riot. Mm -hmm. So that, that perception is always going to be there, but I think you just have to live it out in such a way that they actually see that there's, you've got something much deeper, much more satisfying, much more fulfilling than anything that this world has to offer. Yeah, I think that's, I think that's great. There's been some fantastic points made. Um, you know, as, as Christians, we have that responsibility um, to explain um, what... Christianity is all about, <laughs> that at its center, it's all about knowing God. Um, and that is a wonderful privilege. It should be something which is, is deeply fulfilling uh, in, in life. Uh, yes, it comes with requirements because God, uh, God is a holy character and he expects us to live in a certain way, uh, ultimately for our good and blessing. Um, but all of all of that really shapes how we live, and, and ultimately the example that we're trying to follow is 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 the example of of the Lord Jesus. Um, but I think there's been some really good points about how that unique perspective and that unique life purpose shouldn't lead us into social isolation, um, and we have that responsibility, just as Jesus did, as you as you mentioned, Stephen, um, to engage with the world in which we live. Uh, we're to be here um, and we're to, to, to share with them the hope that we have, yeah. uh, which should be anything but boring. Mm -hmm.